Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Come on, give yourselves a hand for being here. Everything's bigger in Texas. And so I really count an honor and privilege to stand before you for, of course, this case for kids out of school time conference. And of course, to all the members and leaders of the Harris County Department of Education, it's, it's great to be here, uh, straight out of Detroit. <laughs> And of course, I, I really have to honor and acknowledge all of these great individuals. Of course, our MC, uh, Ms. Melinda Spaulding, to uh, Mr. James Colbert, Jr., the county school uh, superintendent. Uh, of course, Ms. Molly Claxton, um, as well as all of those who are in protocol, all those I don't know at all. Uh, it's great to see everybody today. I, I have to give deference and recognize really three dynamic uh, ladies, three dynamic divas. Uh, in the purchase of Ms. Renee Johnson, Ms. Nakaji Turner, and of course, our very own Dr. Lisa Carruthers. Why don't you help me celebrate her? And of course, I appreciate them for the opportunity to be here today, as well as I thank them for their hospitality. And of course, you saw the, the video montage of some of the work that I'm doing in Detroit. Arnie Duncan would call our city ground zero for education. Uh, as well as for after school program. And so we're really trying to turn the tide and stem the tide of what is going on in our city, especially with the literacy being at 60% uh, rate in the city of Detroit. But I'm great that we have, I'm so excited that we have mentors, leaders, motivators, directors who are encouraged to turn all those stumbling blocks into stepping stones. Uh, you know, Frederick Douglass declared, he said, if we build strong boys, we won't have to repair broken adults. If we build strong boys, we won't have to repair broken men. If we build strong youth, we won't have to repair broken adults. According to uh, the mayor of Houston, Texas, uh, Mayor Anise Parker, she says low literacy is the root cause of almost all social issues, including crime rates, dropout rates, joblessness, homelessness, social injustice, as well as health ed equity issues. And for today, what I want to do is really empower you. I want to inspire you. I want to motivate you in the work that you're already doing to collaborate and to create greater change. Um, much of what you see me doing as an author, as a professor over at Mary Road College, uh, as a speaker, and I have some roots as well, uh, growing up in Kingston, Jamaica. Yeah, my, yeah. my Caribbean people here. <laughs> Uh, but really, outside of the background, there's a number of obstacles that I had to overcome in my life. A lot of obstacles that I had to grapple with and, and really find a test, testimony out of the test that I experienced. Many of us are familiar with the phrase, Houston, we have a problem. Are we not? Which has become a staple, really, in the American lexicon to describe something that has gone awry. Something that is now troubling. It's often used when something is just not right. This phrase originated during when the manned Apollo space aircraft attempted to land on the moon after being launched on April 11th, 1970. And on that aircraft of Apollo 11, three men were on board that aircraft, Jim, La Jim Lavelle, Jack Swigger, and Fred Haynes. While en route and on board explosion, an explosion deprived their spacecraft of two things, one being an oxygen supply and two being electrical power. And really it forced that control crew member to report a problem back to the Houston base with the words that we're so familiar with. Houston, we have a problem. NASA's flight control was immediately aborted. The moon landing as a result was brought about a struggle eventually getting the three men home safely. Fortunately, a lifeboat was their lifeline as they returned back to Earth. Ladies and gentlemen, how many of our youth are just like the Apollo 11 aircraft? They seek to go into orbit and succeed. They desire to achieve their dreams. They desire to become that doctor, that lawyer, that engineer. They desire to engineer their future, only to, to discover that they are void of some basic necessities, basic access to opportunities, 
living in impoverished neighborhoods and communities, lack of support, low level reading skills, minimal education, and their dreams now, get this, have exploded into a nightmare. As a result, now they have to abort their dreams because maybe nobody was in their life to push them, to motivate them, to help them to persevere in spite of the peril that they're facing. Houston, we have a problem. When 66% of Latino children and 23% of black children are economically disadvantaged, disadvantaged in Harris County, 52% of youth are at risk of dropping out in Harris County. But how will we solve the problem? How will we resolve this problem? I would suggest that I am an optimist, so I firmly <coughs> attest to the fact that we are the leaders that we've been looking for. We are the supermen and the superwomen who can strategize, who can mobilize, who can organize to really stamp out illiteracy, to stamp out the high incarceration epidemic, to stamp out crime and poverty and unemployment. Houston. Not only do we have a problem anymore, but Houston, we have a solution. Because the men and women that can change this community, that can change this county, are sitting right here in this room. I would that you would just do something for me today. I just want you to just lean over, just nudge somebody sitting next to you. Just tell them how much they owe you for allowing them to sit next to you. <laughs> Stuff chicken. <laughs> the reason I say that, the reason I say that is because you're sitting next to a gift. You're sitting next to somebody who's been through hell and high water. You're sitting next to somebody who's had to overcome some obstacles. And because of what they've overcome, they can now help somebody else, some other young person, to overcome the obstacles that they face. I believe that the Harris County Department of Education and Case for Kids is a lifeboat and a lifeline that gives young people direction to their dreams when their communities have exploded, when their households have exploded in terror, when maybe they're from the east side of Detroit like I am, which is faced with a lot of blight and negativity to where 95% of many of those households are single parent motherland. They can now, you all can now, help somebody to still go into orbit and soar beyond what they have been facing. Tabitha Smiley suggested, and he put it this way, he says, young people are like Kodak film. All they need is development and exposure. And oftentimes, what we have to do is be developed and exposed to opportunities in the dark room of our circumstances, in the dark room of our situation and really develop and turn the negative into a positive. And so, because of it, in the year of 2011, I've been a teacher for the last 10 years at University High School in Ferndale, right outside Detroit. And I worked on my master's degree over at Maryville College where I'm now serving as a professor in reading and literacy. And oftentimes when I'd be in the classroom, I taught health, taught history, taught civics, many of those subjects, teaching on the collegiate level, social justice, literacy advocacy. Oftentimes when young men would open up a book, guess what? Their eyes would close. They get some of the best sleep <laughs> when they open up a book. I'm telling you, just knocked out all day. And I began as I was working on my program, I saw that culturally relevant literature is so important. It would use CRP, and really CRP is CPR for many of our young people because culturally relevant pedagogy, culturally relevant literature is where our young people see their lives reflected in what they read. Walter D. Myers, uh, the late Walter D. Myers, writer of over 100 novels, says this. He says, books transmit values. If I'm not in the book, what does that say about my values? Come on. Yeah. Come on. And so when we expose young people to who they are with rich literature, with self-esteem, with empowerment, with encouragement, and inspire them to say, guess what? You can learn something out of this book. You can learn something from a Tupac Shakur who said, be the rose that grows through the concrete. Right. And so in 2011, I began to say, guess what? I got to spend my time connecting with our young men outside of just eight to three. 
because they're going back into a cesspool of negativity. They're going back into a cesspool of community. We tell them to stay out of the streets. We tell them to pull their pants up. We tell them, you know, pull your grades up. And I, I guarantee you, if you pull up a young man's self-esteem, if you pull up some young person's character, their pants will be no problem. When you pull them up from the inside and empower them and expose them to greater things outside of just rapping on a microphone, bouncing a basketball, uh, trying to be Jeezy, Weezy, Yeezy, and Jay-Z. All right, y'all don't know none of them. <laughs> but guess what? You better get to know them because they influence our young people. They influence how they think. Many of our young people would rather not, uh, they'd rather listen to, to Nicki Minaj and Beyonce than, than work on their history and their chemistry. But we have to develop a chemistry of a collaboration and a connection with our young people. So I've got a few slides today. I developed a program, Voice to Books, which has become nationally recognized in 2011, and I studied the whole aspect of illiteracy and incarceration being so interconnected. And I come from the standpoint that we got, we got to do more than push our young men. We got to push our young men out of prison into prison. We got to push them out of jail into Cornell and Yale. We got to push them out of a four-year uh, correctional facility into a college or a university. But we got to have a heart for love. We got to have a heart to serve. Dr. Cornell West says if you, you can't love people, you can't lead people if you won't love them. And you can't save them if you won't serve them. And so what I began to do is just develop an after-school program, some out-of-school time, to where I turn my classroom into uh, a boy's treehouse, so to speak. Giving our young men, whether it be pizza, whether it be playing hip-hop music, whether it be them working out and having some time with basketball, catering to their interest level first, developing a connection and relatability, and then providing the opportunity with books. I'm telling you, if you just in your, uh, whether it's in a classroom or whether you're in your community, if you just wave in books and uh, wait for people to come in and see what you're all about, they're not going to come. <laughs> You've got to connect to them where they are, relate to them where they are, and take them to where they can be. And so really I came from the whole aspect of, yes, I want to improve our young men's reading skills, but I've got to connect not just literacy, but I've got to connect it to life skills enrichment and leadership development to where our young men see their greatness. I tell our young men all the time that there's a king inside of you. You've got to give birth to who you are on the inside, and you've got to understand that there is a difference between a male and a man. Just because you're born male doesn't make you a man. But it's through the process of responsibility and respectability. And so the goal of the project was, of course, to engage African-American males, and many of my young males now uh, our Latino, Hispanic young males who are also in the program. One thing I wanted to do was, of course, stimulate their love for reading, address the 60% of literacy rate, but also stamp out much of the uh, school, to, not just prison pipeline, but preschool to prison pipeline. And so, at first, I just wanted just to empower young men 13 to 17. But when I really began to get into the meat and potatoes of the whole thing and to find out the new Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander, uh, the Conspiracy to Destroy Black Boys by Dr. Jawanza Kajufu. You've got to reach younger. You've got to get to pre-K. You've got to get to Head Start. You've got to get to first, second, and third grade. If they're not reading by third grade, that's what they're using as a gauge to, to see how many prison beds they're going to be. And so many of these things here, self-esteem, racial awareness, who they are, respectability, responsibility, discipline, uh, a willingness to give back into their community, uh, has not just taken me from Detroit, not just rooted it in Detroit, but it's taken me around the country to begin to birth many of these things in Boston, and in D.C., and many other places around the country. Uh, I like to remix the word freedom. It's not F-R-E-E-D-O-M, but F-R-E-A-D-O-M. And that's when you begin to find out your greatness and who you are on the inside. Frederick Douglass said, once you learn to read, you'll be forever free. Working on this program and empowering many of our young men, literacy, leadership, life skill development, career goals, professionalism, what does it mean to write a resume? How do you apply for a job? And you'll notice on uh, many of these applications, uh, none of them says there's never a checkbox for quitting. 
There's never a checkbox for giving up. There's never a checkbox for throwing in the towel. So in spite of ethnicity, racial, uh, demographic, and makeup, our young men still can soar to new heights. After working uh, in Congress, I worked in Congress as a, an assistant to former Congressman Hanson Clark. And as I was just wanting just to just canvas and just help him out, and this was around 2011, 2012, I came to him, I said, Congressman, I have a program that I've been working on. It's a year in its stage right now. But I believe that this can help provide a gauge of access and opportunity for many of our young men around the country. He looked at the program proposal, which is Boys and Books, addressing literacy, mentorship, access opportunity, college readiness, preparedness, many of that which are much of the stepping stones, the six milestones in my brother's keeper. He took this, this initiative that I have, Boys and Books, to Congress in 2012. And much to my surprise, he got bipartisan support. We worked on a resolution, which became HR 721, in Congress. Uh, and he got bipartisan support from a city Republican, even now, um, Tim Scott, out of South Carolina. Both of these individuals, Hansen Clark and Tim Scott, went to the floor of Congress expressing that they both had problems with literacy. Hansen Clark had dropped out of school, at one point graduated through adult education was homeless for part of his life. Tom, Tom, Tim Scott used these words. Uh, excuse my French, he uses these, he used these words in Congress. He called himself by ignorant He said not only could he not speak Ebonics, he couldn't even, not only could he not speak English, he couldn't speak Ebonics with. Now that's messed up when you're break, breaking down a broken language. <laughs> and, and so from that development, Mr. Clark told me, he says, I guarantee you the president is going to use this resolution, this building block, to develop something. I said, no, no, nah, I'm just a kid from Detroit. It's not going to happen. He said, this is just from Detroit to D.C., but it's not going to hit the White House. Sure enough, 2014, February of 2014, President Obama used this basis to develop my brother's keeper. And it goes to the place I just wanted to help one young person. I just wanted to give back to my community and help lift the city of Detroit to the next level. And the things that you're doing now to empower other people to move to a place of greatness is creating opportunity not just for you, but for them too. To where they can now soar to new heights and move their life to the next level. Of course, you can check out the resolution. It's HR 721. Uh, it's online. It's everywhere. Uh, that you can check it out to see how that has been used to bolster literacy amongst chiefly African American and Hispanic young males. Uh, much of what I've been doing, and we had My Brother's Keeper kickoff in Detroit just about two days ago, uh, really addressing much of those six milestones, getting a healthy start and entering school by being ready to learn reading at grade level by third grade, uh, so on and so on, college career readiness. And this is really just being a place to connect much of our cities, our towns, and our community centers by calling on our mayors to stand behind this initiative to provide opportunities and access for many of our young people. Much of the MDK implementation is what I've already suggested, and really it's about getting our young people to read by third grade quite very, very significant and important. Much of what I was saying earlier today, Houston, we have a problem. You can see here, it suggests that black youth are two and a half times more likely to be in poverty than white youth. And there's a connection that I was even talking uh, to Mr. Colbert about socioeconomic status and how that is a connector and an indicator also of poor performance in school leading to uh, a cesspool of negativity in the communities, but we see how it's very high here in the city of Houston. 50% of Houston's youth, ages 10 to 24, are Hispanic, 25% are black. You've got to engage that demographic. Uh, black males seven more times, seven times more likely to have encounters with law, law enforcement than white males. We know about that, many of these things as well, coming from my brother's keeper. 
black males twice as likely to be sus suspended from school for serious offenses than whites. What we want to do in the city of Detroit as well, and I believe it could be a connector here in Houston, as to how to cut the suspension rate, which is oftentimes that connector for prison pipeline. You know, there's an aphorism that suggests if you have sight but no vision, you're still blind. And really, what it takes here is master mentors, master facilitators, master teachers, master program directors have to have 3D vision. And that 3D vision has to be this. It has to be uh, dignity. It has to be also diversity. And then there also has to be a place for dreams. And when we can light the cauldron of our young people to uh, recognize not just what is wrong with them, but what is right with them, we can see their Aristotelian deduction. We can see their syllogistic reasoning. We can see the gift that's on the inside of them. We can see that they are a red box and a gold bow. That they are a gift to the world. How do we help them to unpackage it? We can't unpackage it until we know and recognize who we are. This African proverb that suggests the two most important dates in your life are number one, the day that you were born, but secondly, the day you realize why you were born. And the why is the indicator for your purpose for your value, for who you are, for the greatness that you have that is on the inside of you. A few more things that I'd like to suggest, and I'd like to do this with you. My good friend, he's a CEO of the Black Male Engagement Organization that I'm a part of, his name is Trevian Shorters, uh, has an example, and I'll practice the exercise with you. Just look at the person that's sitting next to you. Uh, I, I know we're not in church, but I just want you to do this. <laughs> no, I don't need you to high five your neighbor, but just look at the person sitting next to you, and I want you to take about five to ten seconds uh, to just look at them. And as you're looking at them, I, I want you to look. I want you to think about everything that's wrong with them. Uh, <laughs> I'm on your mark, get set, go. Oh, y'all can stop. Y'all can stop. Y'all can stop. Real. Uh, I don't want them to kick me up out of here. Somebody said, I need a little bit more time. <laughs> I found something. As I get ready to wrap up, one thing here is that oftentimes, we look at what is wrong with our young people versus what is right. We look at the negative that they have experienced. We look at where they are coming from rather than who they are and who they can be. And as I really move to my clothes and look at literacy levels and there's data all over the place. The main thing is that I'm a person who's sitting up here, standing up here, and people gave up on me. I'm a person who people threw in the towel and forgot about them, left for dead and said I'd never be anything. If we had on these monitors the color purple, I'd tell you just like seeing that all my life I had to fight. <laughs> Because at the age of 15, I was dealt one of my greatest blows and challenges in life. At the age of 15, I was experiencing a number of different chest pains. And I was a sophomore in high school. My own biological father was not even in my life. Growing up in a single parent divorced household, single parent mother led. And I was diagnosed after experiencing these chest pains with a, with a disease called NHL. I thought it was National Hockey League. I said, I'm the youngest owner of the National Hockey League team. But I was diagnosed with non-Hoskins lymphoma. Not one, not two, not three, but four. Stage four cancer at the age of 15. People gave up on me. My own biological father never visited me one day in the hospital. People didn't think that I was going to make it. After coming out of cancer and, and motivating and encouraging myself to realize with my mother that a knockdown is not a knockout unless you stay down. You got to get back up. You got to get back in the fight again. Because the first three letters of cancer is pain. At the age of 17, as I was getting ready to graduate from high school, my, my, my guidance counselor looked at me and said, Eddie, you're not going to college. You're, you're going to pick up a trade. You need to pick up a trade. Don't even think about community college. You're not college material. To hear that from somebody who should be guiding me, yes. a guidance counselor was depriving me of the opportunity that I had on the inside of me. But rather than going negative on the negative, I went positive on the negative situation. And in spite of that, in spite of a guidance counselor saying that I'd never go to college, I stand before you not just going to college one time, but graduating from college three times. <laughs> Earning a PhD, 
But for her, it stood for a player hated degree. <laughs> but the opportunity that you have to realize is that our young people are coming out of negativity. Our young people are facing a number of different obstacles and odds. We have to be the individuals to spark that. Out of school time, that three to six, is very important. It's very unique. It's very significant because Houston, we have a solution. We are the leaders that we've been looking for. We can empower. We can motivate. We can collaborate. We can do greater things in Harris County than anything else because we have to galvanize what we have on the inside of ourselves. So I encourage you, let's go into orbit. Let's fly higher than ever before. You're not a chicken. You're an eagle. You're not a winner. You're not a whiner. You're a winner. You're not a warrior. You're a warrior. You're not a chump. You're a champion. We have champions in here to move our lives to the next level, and we can overcome by any means necessary. God bless you.